Thank you, Randy. Um, first of all, um, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak here. It's a great pleasure and also honor to be at ICAP and presenting our research. Um, we do work with, uh, as introduced, with optical quantum gases. And what I'm going to present you um, is the first measurement of the compressibility as well as the equation of state for such an optical quantum gas. And we do that by using a novel type of trapping potential, which is currently en vogue in uh, quantum gases, namely uh, box potential. So if I were to give you a substance, okay, let's say it's not toxic or dangerous, I'm not a nasty guy, but uh, I would ask you actually to characterize it, uh, maybe identify the state uh, of matter. Uh, you could do uh, various measurements, yeah? You could do an elaborate uh, technique like spectroscopy, you could run a current through this material and see how it responds. But actually, one of the immediate tests that anyone would do would be to um, test the compressibility, to really apply some pressure on this object and then see, let's say in more technical terms, how um, the energy changes as you reduce the volume of this uh, system. And it turns out that this is a very simple but also a powerful tool to identify states of matter, also quantum states of matter, and phase transitions between them. Now, the compressibility in many body systems, we understand them uh, for material particles uh, actually fairly well. So, um, for example, um, the uh, solid state systems, the MOT insulator, we know we have one popular. <laughs> Uh, we have one particle sitting uh, per lattice side in the MOT insulating case uh, that leads to very strongly suppressed uh, fluctuations and uh, the system is basically incompressible. Similarly, uh, the liquid helium uh, superfluids uh, have a very low compressibility because of strong interactions between the particles and with ultra-cold atoms, uh, for example in BCs, of course, we can tune the interactions using Feshbach resonances and that already allows us to increase the compressibility a bit more. What is not known at all is the compressibility of optical quantum gases. These systems have emerged roughly 15 years ago, um, both uh, uh, in, with exciton polaritons, these are quasi-particles in solid state cavities, and also more recently with photons. And for these systems, one would actually expect due to the relatively weak interactions that the system becomes highly compressible uh, uh, in the a limit of an ideal system actually infinitely compressible. And the compressibility is a very fundamental quantity. Yeah? It tells us actually um, how does the equation of state of such a system look like, how does the system fluctuate, what are the transport properties, for example, for very fundamental uh, excitations such as sound propagation. So regarding the infinitely compressible gas, let's look at something that we all know from our textbooks, namely uh, the ideal Bose gas. Um, and here I'm showing the pressure volume diagram um, uh, with uh, various, uh, well, basically with uh, an isotherm uh, in this PV diagram. So if we prepare our gas at a temperature T and then we reduce the volume, we, we actually increase the pressure and at some point the system undergoes Bose-Einstein condensation and in this region the pressure will not change anymore. So uh, in other words, the derivative here vanishes which means the system becomes infinitely compressible. Of course, that's a very mm, seemingly unphysical situation because it actually uh, becomes unstable against changes of um, the system size. In any real gas of p uh, uh, material particles, we have, of course, repulsive interactions. And these repulsive interactions will uh, push up the pressure uh, in this region and then restore a finite compressibility such that this pathological case is circumvented. However, with the advent of optical quantum gases, one can ask the question again. Now, being able to realize very weak interactions, can we use an optical quantum gas, and in my case, in a two-dimensional setting, namely in a box, to explore this scenario? Now, these homogeneous two-dimensional quantum gases are, or have in recent years really um, led to a lot of new insights uh, on the quantum gases front. I uh, just want to highlight a few achievements uh, from the last years, for example, with ultra-cold atoms. We have uh, now for the first time seen uh, for BKT superfluids first and second sound, and uh, of course, sound measurements are very 
uh, or, or homogeneous gases are a very attractive platform to perform such sound measurements because you have the same um, speed of sound everywhere in your sample. And uh, here first and second sound was observed and that allowed us actually to um, reveal the universal jump of this BKT superfluid at the critical temperature. Then going towards out of equilibrium, a systematic setting like a un uniform gas is of course also very attractive here. There are many studies now looking towards uh, turbulent behavior. Turbulence has been around for many, many decades, but it's still not really understood. And um, uh, here, for example, you can study very nicely and in a clean way the propagation of excitations in the system as you start shaking it. And yesterday we heard also from uh, Giacomo Ruati, uh, similar studies in, in Fermi gases um, where they study uh, vortex turbulence. In polaritons, now going towards uh, a region where we have uh, weaker interactions and are still far from equilibrium, also their box potentials have been implemented um, and that led to the uh, study of topological effects in the vicinity of so-called exceptional points. Exceptional points emerge really when the system becomes uh, or is pushed out of equilibrium. And in this work, I will show you that um, we have now achieved to implement such a uniform gas consisting of photons. And uh, here you can see a density distribution of this, uh, of this gas that we confined in a box trap. Regarding uh, the experiments above, I also uh, would like to mention that uh, you can go to the posters by Martin and Andre and learn more about these studies. Okay, so here's the outline of my presentation. Um, at first, uh, I will discuss the concept of how we can create optical quantum gases inside such a highly reflecting optical cavity. I see here there are mirrors and that uh, is an artist's view of the, um, of the gas of light and how we can create a photon Bose-Einstein condensate here. Then uh, I will move on to discuss how can we confine these particles in, in a box and measure their compressibility, and finally discuss very attractive features of this platform, namely the control uh, of the openness. So you can couple these condensates to reservoirs, and you can also uh, play actually uh, with dissipation a lot. So the concept to create such a photon gas is sketched here. For that, we use uh, something that we call a dye-filled microcavity. So this consists of two highly reflecting mirrors. They are spaced by a wavelength approximately, and then we insert dye molecules, uh, which are in solution and at room temperature. And uh, then the system is initialized by an external pump beam, so we create molecular excitations, and these molecules decay, emit photons, uh, for example, at a frequency omega, which is then reabsorbed uh, and re-emitted subsequently at a different frequency, and that gradually shifts the energy of these uh, photons and establishes a thermal equilibrium between these dye molecules and the photons. And uh, the physical origin of this equilibrium process is that the emission and absorption rates of these molecules have a scaling with the Boltzmann factor. Now, this system is also a deeply two-dimensional system. This we can understand uh, fairly easily by looking at the spectral distribution, uh, both of the dye molecules as well as the states for the photons that are available, so the cavity modes here as a function of optical frequency. You can see this is the emission profile and the Stokes shifted absorption profile at a higher energy. And essentially due to this small cavity length, um, these different manifolds here denoting different longitudinal wave numbers are actually pushed very far spectrally, so the free spectral range is quite large, meaning that photons are only emitted into one of these manifolds and also absorbed from only one of them. So one degree of freedom is frozen out, and in this way the system is deeply two-dimensional, actually much more two-dimensional than many cold atom samples. Furthermore, uh, we can independently control temperature and photon number, so it's not like a black body radiator, that is due to the fact that we have an energy offset in these dye molecules here, and it leads to a chemical potential um, that is non-zero for the light. Now for the system, Bose-Einstein condensation has been observed um, now quite some time ago already, and uh, the condensation occurs at a critical particle number of um, a convenient number of 80,000 photons, something that is very familiar when talking about cold atom systems. 
Uh, here, however, it's at room temperature, and this number is so large because the trapping frequency is also extremely large. So it's 40 gigahertz as compared to the usually kilohertz regions, regimes um, with cold atoms. You can obtain then various type of evidence for this condensation. Uh, I'm show showing just a few. Uh, for example, we can directly access the occupation of the different energy levels. As you can see here for four curves, uh, so we increase the total photon number, and, as we, and these curves are vertically shifted, so as we put in more and more particles, actually we have more and more photons going into this low energy state. That corresponds to the Bose condensate, and this is the saturated thermal tail or thermal cloud. And the same behavior can be also seen in the spatial distribution here in the center, where we see above the critical point a bimodal distribution. Of course, you can do interferometry just like um, you would do it with matter waves. Uh, and see here, below the critical point, you have very short length correlations. This is 1.5 microns. This is just a thermal de Broglie wavelength of these wave packets of photons in the system at room temperature. And as you go to the condensed phase, you then see um, an interference pattern uh, extending over the entire ground mode size. Now, I promised you to go from harmonic traps to box traps, and uh, it's, it's useful to look at the energy-momentum relation in the system. Uh, I told you it's a 2D system, so one degree of freedom, this Kz component, actually is frozen out, and what we uh, obtain is just a rest energy term with a kinetic energy term, and some additional energy that depends on the spacing of your cavity at transverse position x and y, and that implements a potential. So in other words, we here have a 2D trapped massive Bose gas uh, with a very light mass. And if we just play correctly with this delta D, in previous works we were using harmonic traps uh, where delta D scales with R squared. So these are spherical mirrors. Then you realize a harmonic trap um, or a double well trap, for example, to hybridize two of these condensates. Um, but now using a novel technique uh, where we are able to locally elevate the reflective uh, surface of one of these uh, mirrors, we are actually able to implement a box trap. And here you can see the light that is then trapped inside this um, repulsive barrier. Now what is interesting to study here are two things. First, what about Bose-Einstein condensation in two dimensions? We all learn that uh, in two dimensions there is no Bose-Einstein condensation because Merman-Wagner theorem basically tells us long-range fluctuations destroy, uh, or thermal fluctuations destroy long-range order. And um, of course this is a finite size system, so the question is can Bose-Einstein condensation be restored in this setting? Secondly, we are also interested then uh, to have this uh, clean um, uniform density, uh, density distribution uh, and investigate the compressibility. So regarding the Bose-Einstein condensation, you can actually recover a critical phase space density for the Bose-Einstein condensate. It's just given in this formula here with this logarithmic term. And I just want to uh, show some numbers regarding these phase space densities when we compare them to the critical uh, berezinski kostalis saulus phase space density, which is uh, given by this uh, expression. And for atoms where the interaction parameter G tilde is typically on the order of one, um, the critical phase space densities are actually quite comparable. So BEC and BKT occur at similar temperatures, let's say. While for photons, where interactions are fairly weak, this critical phase space density is uh, for BKT is pushed to very large uh, values, whereas um, the BEC uh, is still at a value of approximately 6. So that means here in this setting, we really expect to observe Bose-Einstein condensation first. And yeah, I just want to point out uh, in this uh, review by uh, Zoran Hadzibabic and John Daliba on 2D atomic Bose gases, they were actually writing at the time that reaching the BEC regime may require a more weakly interacting quasi 2D gas than has so far been studied. And here we're not using atoms, but we're using photons uh, to achieve this. Okay, so the experimental scheme to realize this gas um, is very similar to what I discussed before. Um, so we have this cavity with a nanostructured mirror. Uh, we pump it, or pump these dye molecules. We have photons stored inside. Light leaks out of the cavity. We collect it with a microscope objective. And then we are able to both look at the density distribution in the cavity plane, which is shown here. You can see there's less than one photon per micron squared. So this is a deep, normal, classical uh, uh, gas. 
And we can also look in the far field to directly obtain a momentum space distribution, so that's essentially an equivalent to time of flight measurement that you would do with cold atoms. Um, here, uh, two features. First of all, you see that the distribution uh, looks like a Gaussian because we are in a normal phase and nothing is condensed here. Uh, and also the maximum energy that is observed or the maximum wave factor is actually limited by the finite trap depth. So this dashed line is what we get from our, let's say, a prediction of the height of this barrier, which is of course finite, and we cannot make infinitely high walls for this box. And uh, so we see that uh, here uh, there are no photons beyond this value. Of course, we can obtain the temperature then of this photon gas by fitting uh, here uh, the distribution, and we obtain very good agreement with room temperature uh, because the dye molecules are at room temperature. The next thing that you want to study then is what happens if I put more and more particles in the system. Uh, here, uh, going to the right, I'm showing increasing photon number from roughly 1,000 to 7,000 photons. And this is actually for a smaller system, so here we have roughly 40 by 40 micrometers size. Um, so you see uh, at first there's actually a flat top density distribution, pretty much a uniform gas, and then approximately above 4,000 photons, the density starts to buckle up in the center can see this here, and eventually the system is dominated by the ground state in this box potential, which is just a sine squared, uh, um, as we all know from uh, the non-interacting gas in a box. In momentum space, we see an analogous behavior. So you start with, again, this very broad distribution uh, with thermal energy dominating the mean radius, or the mean momentum here. And as we put in more and more particles, there's a more and more concentration of photons in the vicinity of the k equals uh, or kx, ky, zero, zero point that's here in the center. And eventually you see all the photons, or most of the photons are sitting in this ground state, whereas there's still this dark blue um, thermal cloud behind. Of course, we can uh, count particles sitting in these excited states and in the ground state, and when we see that there's a very nice BEC-like saturation behavior, so the photon um, number in the excited modes at some point does not incre increase further as we increase the total photon number. And that actually defines the critical particle number. Okay, so one interesting question obviously is what happens if you make the system larger and larger? At some point you would expect that Bose condensation does not occur anymore and the whole um, um, finite size uh, effect breaks down. And for that purpose we went to larger and larger box sizes up to 90 by 90 micron and we can recover really here quite well the um, critical particle number scaling with L squared times some logarithmic uh, correction factor and that's uh, an important factor because this really tells us that it's a finite size effect. So in other words, NC over L squared times lambda squared scales with log uh, L and if L goes to infinity, the critical phase based density goes to infinity. So that's all fine. Now, how can we use this uniform gas to obtain mechanical properties? of light. It turns out that this is very straightforward actually in these platforms. You see here we have again this cavity and it's an open access cavity. Here we have a potential, a uh, box potential inside this cavity. And what we can do now is we just tilt one of the cavity mirrors and that actually superimposes a linear potential gradient on top of this box with a very well controlled um, energy elevation over the system size L and you know u naught over L, that's just a force that will push on this gas. And indeed, we see the response of the photon density very nicely here. I still find this quite remarkable that you can see this actually. So clearly, how it's displaced to the right as you start pushing this gas. And from the center of mass, we can do more. Um, we can actually extract um, the compressibility. You can see here the scales with the u naught value, so the strength of your applied gradient and also um, with the compressibility of the gas. And now doing this for various different densities, we obtain the compressibility of this ideal gas, or nearly ideal gas. Um, and the compressibility at first, so I want to just basically separate this plot into a classical and a quantum region. Uh, and in this classical region at low densities, you at first see that the compressibility drops, it just essentially follows an ideal gas law. It becomes harder and harder to compress as you have more and more particles in the system. And eventually it deviates from this. So this prediction would just go down here. But it eventually deviates and bends up. And that is when quantum effects 
become important. So quantum statistics here tells us that the wave packets suddenly grow and grow. And this is still in a region when the gas is not condensed. Yeah? So um, this is still before actually the correlation length is spanning over the system size. That happens only here. So we find very good agreement with this uh, dashed line, which is the infinite size 2D prediction. And uh, this is truly a quantum enhancement of the uh, susceptibility. And uh, it's actually a very sensitive effect. So we could add a single atom here uh, under one of these mirrors, and we could be able uh, to measure this uh, very precisely. Of course, the equation of state is directly connected to the compressibility. Yeah? It's just a derivative, essentially. Um, or vice versa, the compressibility is the derivative of the equation of state. And uh, we know that uh, this is quite established for material particles. It has been done with bosons, fermions, various dimensions, interacting, non-interacting. But it has never been seen for optical quantum gases. And here we use the same technique. So we transfer our, um, or transform our um, spatial density distributions uh, to... Uh, distributions as a function of the chemical potential and in this way are able to stitch together the density as a function of chemical potential. And you see the dashed line here that corresponds to the prediction of the 2D Bose gas as a deviation and this deviation comes from the fact actually that the barrier height of these walls so is, is finite. Yeah? So this is well understood. Okay, so with this I'm uh, finished with, uh, with the uniform gases. I want to highlight some interesting features uh, that you have here in these uh, optical gases uh, like like a photon condensate and um, let's have a look again at this at this picture of the of the gas inside um, a cavity uh, what we have now is of course there are some photons but i told you the photons are not alone they are coexisting with molecules and actually these molecules are emitting photons and they are also absorbing photons in other words they are coexisting with a reservoir and can have particle exchange with it. So if you have perfect mirrors, let's say in the perfect world, uh, that will never be realized, of course, but uh, we can have really good mirrors, let's say. You pump this system, you initialize uh, the number of excitations, and um, then, depending on the system parameters, saying what is actually the ratio of these and what is the absolute value, it will give rise to a certain average number of photons and an average number of excited molecules. Now, if this number of excited molecules is fairly small as compared to n squared, then you can see that the emission, so the number of photons as a function of time is actually just as Poissonian statistics. It's very much like an ultra-cold atomic gas that is isolated from the environment, so this would be canonical statistical conditions. However, we can here go to also large reservoirs, so we can increase this m up value and then we see that the photon emission actually shows very strong fluctuations, and these are induced by the presence of the reservoir. So you have, in the Grand Canonical Ensemble, um, strong fluctuations between your reservoir and the system. And this has been actually a long-standing question, you know, whether this is at all physical or valid for the Bose condensed phase. And here we could observe this. Now, if you have fluctuations of a system, uh, you start to wonder, is there something like a fluctuation-dissipation relation? And it turns out there is. Uh, but just to wrap uh, or quickly say, the fluctuation-dissipation relation essentially tells us that um, number fluctuations and energy fluctuations uh, here in this equation are related by some response function, some susceptibility that translates them into each other. And, uh, or in other words, the intrinsic fluctuations are equal somehow to the response as you perturb your system. Um, and uh, for our system, uh, this response function uh, is actually given by the change of the number of condensed particles as you change the detuning, which is the frequency difference between the condensate and the dye molecule resonance. Um, and to, to give you some intuition of what is happening, uh, we can tune the cavity length in this way, change the frequency, and that gives rise here in this far detuned case to many photons, a few excited molecules. Here we have very weak fluctuations and also a very strong response. So in that regime, if I change delta a little bit, it will change to drastic, uh, um, or will change drastically also the photon number. Whereas uh, in this limit of very small detunings, I have many excited molecules and only a few condensate photons. Here I have strong fluctuations and a very weak response. And of course, what is nice is we can independently measure correlations and this reactive response. And here you can see the result when we scale actually this term with KBT, 
T at room temperature, we see this uh, nice agreement between both sides of the equation. But all, of course, you can also do a more rigorous check of uh, this thermometry or perform thermometry based on fluctuations uh, by dividing this term with respect to this term. And then you obtain actually again um, the temperature of this of the, of the gas. Uh, and that's um, actually very nice because it's just looking at the microscopic fluctuation properties of a condensate. Okay, <laughs> I'll try to hurry. Um, uh, so, uh, of course, it is not a perfect cavity. Yeah, I was uh, um, promising something that is not real. Um, in reality, we always have some dissipation out of our system. Uh, some photons will leak out, so there's a mirror transmission, and here you can see that uh, the gas now actually is coupled to the environment, and this dissipation can be uh, observed, and it can be actually a resource. Uh, so uh, the situation, as described before, will slightly change. We still have the photons and the molecules, but now the photons will actually lead to a lost channel because they go out of the cavity and we have some driving here that we need to uh, always fill up uh, or we need to maintain this driving to fill up the reservoir and now this number the sum of excited molecules and photons is not strictly conserved anymore but it actually is conserved only on temporal average and that gives rise to new types of fluctuation dynamics namely non-hermitian effects so the system really becomes dominated by certain uh, decay mechanisms. And here I'm uh, just showing briefly the uh, coupled equations of motions for the photon number variation and this excitation number variation. And you can see they are coupled by a matrix that is actually non-hermitian or uh, put in simple terms, the eigenvalues of this equation are in general complex numbers. And uh, if you look at it, of course, uh, this is not uh, randomly chosen, uh, delta omega, that essentially resembles here a, a damped harmonic oscillator. Uh, with a frequency omega and a damping delta with the only difference that uh, here omega and delta depend on the system parameters like the condensate number. And this dynamics is actually always driven by statistical fluctuations. So we can see this in the correlation function. And for small photon numbers, we see there are two real eigenvalues. So you have this bi-exponential decay of the second order correlation. And you see oscillations as a function of the decay for very large n, and if we vary the photon number then even further, we can actually nicely see that there are complex eigenvalues in this part and real eigenvalues in this part. So these are essentially the damping times, which are separated by an exceptional point. Okay, so this brings me to the summary. Um, I've shown you uh, measurements, first measurements actually, of the compressibility and the equation of state of light. Uh, and uh, discussed a fluctuation dissipation relation and how we can use dissipation as a resource. And in the future, of course, we want to investigate more thoroughly uh, uniform gases, look at how does phase order uh, occur, uh, what are the density correlations, can we maybe even have sound propagation in the system, uh, can we use them for novel thermodynamic machines or investigate dissipative type of interactions that are due to losses out of the system. And uh, for coupled condensates or even single photon condensates, we are interested in extending this study of the fluctuation dissipation relation to a frequency dependent one. So really time resolved measurements, time resolved perturbation uh, of this molecular reservoir. And we want to emulate spin systems uh, and turbulence in these larger structures and something that I want to quickly highlight, also topological effects. And um, the idea behind studying topology in this setting is that you can actually explore it in the context of open systems. So for, for any system, actually, usually the coupling to the environment, you would say, it's a challenge. Yeah, you have decoherence, you have heating, particle loss. That's all not very desirable. Uh, the idea here is actually to use this openness to create new topological states. So this is, in some sense, a new paradigm. Uh, and to do so in a topologically trivial lattice. So these are photons sitting in such a uniform hopping system. And then you start to modulate the reservoirs that you couple to these condensates. And in this way, you can actually induce novel topological states, or at least that's predicted, uh, and investigate for uh, edge states at the boundary of these domains. And of course, what is attractive is that you can control phases uh, from the outside. So actually, um, you can look at um, um, reconfigurable topologically protected states. These states don't have a closed system counterpart. And something in the context of fluctuations that is very interesting to be studied here is what is actually the fate of topology at finite temperatures. And um, I just recently learned that I got for this project um, the starting grant, so I'm also looking for people who are interested uh, uh, in, the, in the future to join me on this journey.
Okay, so finally, let me thank my collaborators, uh, which are it's very inspiring to work with them always. And um, yeah, on the one hand side in Bonn, on the photon gases, on the other side uh, in Cambridge, on the ultra cold atoms. And with this, um, yeah, I'm done. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Julianne. We have time for questions. Both can. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, it's it's uh, absolutely a very good question. Ah, the repeated question. Whether it's uh, the fact that I don't see an infinite compressibility, whether that uh, arises from the fact that I have a finite size system with a finite uh, ground state energy in this box. And um, yeah, that's uh, indeed the case. Um, at some point, if the system condenses, I will add additional particles and they will add an energy that corresponds to the ground state energy of the box, which is only an infinite system, of course, zero. But here we have the uh, Heisenberg uh, uncertainty in that sense. Yeah. So do, you, do you see the normal modes go soft exactly where you expect the compressibility to go to zero? Um, we, have not, uh, we have not studied uh, uh, this, these, these, these effects uh, yet. Um, actually, um, so these are actually static measurements. So we are not there yet that we can compress a gas in situ. So we cannot like with, we do, we do with cold atoms, prepare it in a box and then compress it. But we always essentially prepare uh, the potential beforehand and then load the system. Okay. All right, we have a question over here on the left dial. Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe this is a very, very naive question. So I remember from textbook, uh, it says if you have a 2D homogeneous trap and you have long interacting particles, it won't form a BEC at a finite temperature because the energy density is uh, constant. But here you for sure uh, observe the formation of BEC. I was wondering, is this because your system is an intrinsically uh, driven dissipation system, or is it because you have some effective interaction between photons? No, it's uh, neither because of... Uh, oh, ah, something okay. else. <laughs> okay, repeat the question. Uh, yeah. The question was um, whether Bose-Einstein condensation, usually we wouldn't expect this in two dimensions in the infinite homogeneous system, but here it occurs, and whether the reasons are due to interactions, for example. Um, it's related to the previous question. Um, the effect, these are nearly ideal particles. There are no interactions and it's not due to dissipation. It's really due to the fact that it's a finite size system. You can think of it as maybe in, an intuitive picture would be to say you have a gas of uh, bosons and then you change the chemical potential yeah, as you add more and more particles. What happens is that this will change the correlation length of your system. It will act, it grows like something one over root of the chemical potential. So it will grow and grow and grow, and eventually it will grow to be larger than your system size. And that's the point when this condensation sets in. So it's a pure finite size effect. Um, and uh, as I said, we saw this logarithmic correction term in the critical particle number. Maybe uh, I can go there briefly. Um, yeah, it was here actually. Uh, this, um, this term here. This is log L over lambda. That accounts for this uh, no BEC in the infinite system. Yeah? If I do NC over L squared times lambda squared, that gives me the critical phase space density. It's just proportional to this log term. If L goes to infinity, critical phase space density is infinity. All right, we have another question down here. Hi, I have a question again about interactions in your system. I remember on one slide you showed a non-zero G, and I was wondering what the origins of that were, given that we typically learn in textbooks photons are non-interacting. And follow up, is that G strong enough to observe, for instance, any collective modes in the BEC? Mm -hmm. um, so Go ahead and repeat the question. The question was um, whether, so I mentioned that interactions, um, there is an interaction parameter, it's very small, but it's non-zero, whether that's enough to observe collective effects or what's the origin, the physical origin of it. 
and um, it's more uh, like um, it's, it's not a very precise measurement, this 10 to the minus 6 that I was giving. Uh, we have certain effects that are actually delayed, thermo-optic effects. So you can think of it as the index of refraction in these cavities changes if there are many photons or very little photons. This could be thermo-optic, this could also be a Kerr effect. Um, the Kerr effect is usually even weaker, although it's something that we, we would like because it, it's an instantaneous interaction. Um, but here, uh, this 10 to the minus 6 that I was giving, actually, it, it just corresponds to a measurement of the energy uh, change in the condensate, um, uh, and it's, it's a very small effect. So it's actually, we do not expect that in the condensed phase, collective effects can be observed. The speed of sound, essentially, uh, would be <laughs> zero. All right, question right, right. here. Yeah, um, it's pretty fundamental over there. It's pretty fundamental, but I didn't get why, uh, what gives the um, effective mass to the photon at the beginning and what rises to like um, the trap frequency and why it's not a black body radiation out of this cavity and things like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Many questions. Okay, so where the effective mass comes from. Uh, this is something that uh, is very specific to these micro resonators. So um, in, a, in, a, in a free photon uh, situation, black body radiator, of course, uh, you just have this linear dispersion here. Um, but if you uh, look at this small uh, superscript here, it actually shows us that Kz, one wave vector component, is much larger than the transverse wave vector components because it's one over the length of the cavity. And L is very small, let's say, so that Kz becomes large. And in this way, you freeze out one degree of uh, freedom, and that degree of freedom corresponds to this rest energy. Okay, so it's it just because you trade in one dimension to become, uh, so, so the gas becomes massive. Okay, so it would not be possible to have this experiment in 3D. No. Yeah. Okay, last question, Bill. I got lots of questions, but <laughs> uh, let's go to the Grand Canonical Ensemble and the, um, uh, the fluctuations. Now, as you said, there was a lot of controversy uh, in the early days of BEC about whether there would be these big uh, uh, fluctuations. And uh, uh, it seems like uh, people stopped talking about it, but it seemed like, I mean, we, we didn't have the big fluctuations and people thought, well, if I'm close to, uh, to TC, then the small BEC looks like uh, uh, sees the, the thermal gas as a kind of reservoir, and so it looks sort of like a, uh, a grand canonical ensemble, and we don't see those big fluctuations, and you do. So could you say more about what is so different here? Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, so the, um, it's indeed like this. The reservoir that we consider here is not the thermal reservoir. So these are not the particles sitting in the excited state but uh, it's a really a, a different type of excitation uh, that lives around the condensate. So these molecules here, they are not part of the system of the photon gas itself. So you have to, have all the thermodynamics, everything that we discuss, if I say I have n photons in my condensate, this is just this part here. But there's always an exchange um, with these molecules, and uh, so basically I have a total number of excitations and it is comprised of excited molecules and photons. Now, if I choose the parameters of the system in a proper way, then on average, M up can be much, 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 much larger than N. And that gives rise, if you look at the photon number statistics for this condensate, it actually changes from being Poissonian, it actually becomes broader and broader, becomes Bose-Einstein-like, and that means you get very strong number fluctuations. And uh, so this is the essential difference here. We really have a reservoir that is uh, existing where the atoms are, uh, where the photons are. Yeah. So the point then is that in the atomic gases, this idea of a reservoir, it's a fake. And this one is a real reservoir, and that makes all the difference. Is that a fair way of saying it? <laughs> <laughs> so in other words, if you pumped your, your atomic gas Bose condensate, would you s then expect to see these kinds of fluctuations? Mm, yes, I think if you, if you were able to really engineer a reservoir that is um, uh, living at the same position as your atomic uh, BEC, uh, I, I would guess if you have a mechanism that actually takes, I mean, you still have to have a microscopic mechanism that takes 
the atoms from the reservoir into right. the condensate. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I still simply think that with cold atoms, the problem is you cool down, and at some point you don't have enough uh, atoms sitting in the excited states anymore. So I, I wrote down this, this uh, condition for yeah. a reservoir. It, it has to be quadratically larger. Um, so we have to have a lot of excited molecules there. Yeah. Uh, but I want to also acknowledge <laughs> that there, has been a there have been recent uh, studies actually on cold atoms where they observed fluctuations uh -huh. in the vicinity. Um, in Jan Alt's group in, in, in Aarhus. So, so I lied. Bill is not the last question. <laughs> There's one more online from Jason Ho. And Jason asks, can you comment on the polarization of the photon, i.e. the polarization of the electric field? Mm -hmm. That's a good, very um, good question. Uh, the, well, what we observe here is that the system is, uh, ha has a degree of polarization. So it's essentially, um, yeah, maybe, a, it, it's not fully polarized, uh, but it has like 20 to 80 percent. But it's um, nothing that we actually consider uh, here. Yeah. So it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, polar th there is a degree of polarization, but it's not 100 percent. All right, well, with that, let's uh, thank Julian for an exciting talk. Okay.